Maura Murray was born on May 4, 1982, in Hanson, Massachusetts. By the age of 21, she was 5'7 and 120 pounds. On February 9, 2004, in Haverhill, New Hampshire, Maura Murray crashed her car on Route 112. There has never been a confirmed sighting of Maura since that night. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Maura Murray, please contact the New Hampshire State Police. This is the Missing Maura Murray Podcast. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray Podcast. Today we are going to read two letters that Fred Murray, Maura's dad, wrote to one incoming governor of New Hampshire and one outgoing governor of New Hampshire. And we wanted to read these letters because we find them interesting. It is important to note, I think, that in time of crisis, you don't know how you would react. So it's really hard to judge someone on his words during a time of crisis. Lance is going to pick up the reading of the letter, but you can also go to YouTube and read the letter along with this video. The link is in the show notes, but also you can just go to youtube.com slash Murray. Also, if you have anything to say to us or add to this case, we would love to interact with you. Please email us at missingmoramurray at gmail.com and please follow our Twitter account at moramurraydoc, D-O-C. Thank you very much. On February 9th, 2005, the one-year anniversary of Maura's disappearance, her father, Fred Murray, wrote one letter to Governor Craig Benson, and he wrote another letter to Governor John Lynch. The letter to Craig Benson reads, Governor Benson, my daughter, Maura Murray, went missing after a one-car accident on February 9th, 2004, approximately 7 p.m., while she was heading east on Route 112 near North Haverhill, New Hampshire. Eyewitnesses place her at the crash site at one or two minutes before the local police arrived and no one was seen to stop and pick her up in a vehicle. This means that when police reached the scene, Mora could have been no further than a couple of hundred yards up the road around the first corner walking away. Another witness who stopped and talked with her reported to the police upon their arrival that the driver of the car was a young woman of approximately 20 years of age. He added that he thought she'd been drinking. There was an empty beer bottle found in the car, and in addition, there was a spider hole in the driver's side of the windshield indicating that she had struck her head at impact. The temperature that evening was 12 degrees. Given these known facts, it was grossly negligent of the police to not dispatch a cruiser in active pursuit in a spirited effort to retrieve an unsuspecting and vulnerable girl with a possible head injury and subject to hypothermia because of alcohol and frigid temperatures before she wandered into the pitch black of the national forest looming just ahead. The police had full knowledge that if she were to encounter someone with ill intent, that she would have no place to hide, no place to run, and absolutely no help available. Furthermore, duty as well as common sense obligates the police to call ahead to the next town in the direction they had to assume she was heading. They knew they had not passed her as they drove east to the accident site during their response to the 911 call. The Woodstock police were not notified, nor asked to send an officer to intercept her by driving west in the direction in which she was approaching. She was figuratively and nearly literally right there, readily available to be rescued and saved from whatever fate has befallen her. All that the police had to do was to expend minimal mental and physical effort and my daughter Mora would be safely here with me today. But unfortunately, the police neglected to make even the most basic effort to find her, and I remain without her now and perhaps forever. 
The onus of this irresponsible and possible fatal lack of action lies not only with the North Haverhill Force, but also with the New Hampshire State Police who responded to the 911 calls from the neighbors as well. Recently, nearly three months after the accident, a motorist who is driving west on Route 112 at about 8 p.m. on February 9th reported seeing a young person acting furtively, heading very fast in an easterly direction at a point about four to five miles away from the scene of the crash. And furtively, I just had to look up because it's not a very common word. Uh, the definition says done in a quiet and secret way to avoid being noticed. Continuing with the letter, the timeline and description of the individual's appearance and clothing fits perfectly for this person to have been Mora. This witness lives just within yards of the accident site, but said he had been confused about the exact date and time of the event because the state police had not interviewed him until 10 days had passed. As hard as this is to believe, it is actually true since an investigator helping the family questioned him on Sunday, February 15th, and he said the police hadn't been there to talk to him yet. At this point, I appealed directly to the state police to pay attention to rudimentary procedure and turned our notes over to them. This apparently prompted a blatant response, which led to the questioning of this witness on Thursday, February 19th that this nearly immediately located neighbor who could have been a prime source of critical information should have been questioned in a timely fashion on the very evening of the accident or at the latest on the following day is a fully reasonable expectation of adequate investigative policy. If this had occurred, this person would have had immediate recollection of the sighting of my daughter and a quote unquote hot lead would have ensued. Statistics, which are very well known by state police agencies, indicate that cases get solved from tips received in the first two or three days or they go cold forever. To wait 10 days to speak to such an obvious source of potential crucial information based on its proximity to the event will be hard to explain even for those adept at this skill. It's no wonder that the state police are reluctant to release to me their accident report to which I am probably legally entitled. I get nearly physically sick when I wake up each morning and the thought of how really little effort it would have taken to rescue my daughter automatically flashes through my mind. It has been over three months since her disappearance and the only leads developed have been handed to the state police by others. Yet still, these guys maintain that they don't need any help. The FBI offered its assistance during the opening week of this case, but have only been utilized in a very minor way, such as interviewing family members and high school friends in Mora's hometown of Hanson, Massachusetts, and also a couple of college acquaintances. These state police officers are great people personally, and I like them and respect them. They are the type of men and women that you and I would be very pleased to have living in our own neighborhoods. But the inescapable reality remains that they clearly need help finding Mora. The finest resource in the world is available, and you, sir, should direct Lieutenant John Scarinza and Troop F to accept its offer. There are corollary cases in Vermont also, and this entire situation begs for central coordination and investigation by an agency which is not bound by the confines of the configuration of Grafton County and the Connecticut River. The young women in the northern region of your state are not safe, and it is clearly imperative that you act decisively before you lose another. Deep within themselves, your citizens are nervously apprehensive and anxiously waiting your response to this threat. He signs it respectfully, Fred Murray. Dates it February 9th, 2005, Mr. Frederick Murray. Pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. The last couple of lines here are very interesting to me. The young women in the northern region of your state are not safe, and it is clearly imperative that you act decisively before you lose another. He's referencing Brianna Maitland and Brooke Wilberger. That's who I believe he's referencing. 
I agree that there's some really interesting stuff here that I'm curious about why he worded it certain ways or what exactly he is talking about. And I just want to say first, we're not trying to defame Fred Murray. We're not trying to point our fingers at him and, and call him a witch um, and, and say he did harm to Mora either by pushing her away or physically himself. We're just curious why the letter is odd. I mean, I don't know how you hear it and say it's not odd. And, you know, to be honest, I feel very badly for this guy, Fred Murray. Um, you know, he's clearly a, ver a very hurt man with all this. So we're not trying to defame him. We're not trying to say he's guilty or anything. We're just trying to look at all this information that we have and figure out what the most likely scenario is. And based on this letter, it, it makes me very curious. I mean, we were curious about Fred before, but this is a curious letter. Do you want to start at the top of this letter? Because there are a few things that he equates as facts, which I don't believe are facts. Or maybe they were facts at the time, and since then they've been um, kind of perverted. Right. Um, because in the first paragraph here, he says there was an empty beer bottle found in the car, uh, which we don't believe is accurate. Unless it was the wine coolers from the statement saying that... No, I remember the wine coolers being there. There was a six-pack of Seagram's wine coolers, but that's not a beer bottle, and uh, there was no account of it being of any of them being empty. What strikes me about this is the language he uses is very articulate and well-written, or the attempts are there to make this sound very very um well written and uh and it's almost like over wordy you know what i mean definitely first of all he says it was grossly negligent of the police not to dispatch a cruiser in active pursuit in a spirited effort to retrieve an unsuspecting and vulnerable girl with a possible head injury and subject to hypothermia because of alcohol and frigid temperatures before she wandered into the pitch black of the national forest looming just ahead that's like that that's one sentence right there and it's 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 like almost poetic it you is know what it's I, very yeah. yeah like the national forest the pitch black of the national forest looming just ahead and then later on what i like about it is he starts talking like a regular guy saying like these guys couldn't do this at one point he says it has been over three months since her disappearance it's been a year so did it take him nine months to write this letter yeah, I mean, he could have started writing this uh, like three months into it, right? I mean, I wouldn't question that, that he did, but the way that, you know, there doesn't seem to be any typos, and like you said, it's downright poetic at certain points, that you would have thought that there'd be enough proofreading to make that, you know, it's been a year since her disappearance and not it's been over three months. I mean, it is signed, respectfully, Fred Murray... Underneath that, it says February 9, 2005, and underneath that, it says Mr. Frederick Murray. Also, at the end that we were kind of kind of getting at, the young women in the northern region of your state are not safe, and it is clearly imperative that you act decisively before you lose another. Deep within themselves, your citizens are nervously apprehensive and anxiously awaiting your response to this threat. I understand that he's probably referencing Brianna Maitland and other uh, women who have gone missing in New Hampshire. But it almost sounds like a threat itself, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like a guilt trip to me. Do something about this before you lose more of these girls. Yeah. It sounds like leverage. I guess. And something else that's interesting and it reminded me of this when reading this letter is uh, that there was a killer called the Connecticut River Valley Killer. And he mentions the Connecticut River right before this part of the letter right before the end of the letter just wanted to mention that this was an unidentified serial killer um, believed to be responsible for a series of similar knife murders mostly around new hampshire and the connecticut river valley primarily in the 1980s and this person has never been caught right right when I read that, the first thing I thought was he's referencing Connecticut River. The next paragraph is about the young women in the northern region of your state are not safe. It does sound like he's making a connection there. I'm not going to say that he's making a connection there, but it does sound like he's trying to make the connection by saying Connecticut River 
obviously, you know, law enforcement is going to read that next line is the young women in the northern region of your state, your state are not, not safe. So maybe he was trying to make the connection without coming right out and saying it. Yeah, I can see that. I'm not an investigator. I'm not, you know, on the New Hampshire State Police. And I read that and then the next line. And that's what I thought. If you Google connecticut river valley killer you'll you'll get a lot of information he was never found there is a few composite sketches out there that are you know they're creepy like any composite of a killer is just wanted to to throw that out there just kind of weird i i suppose he's probably mentioning it just to remind the governor about that problem and that unsolved case if he's trying to do it in the first place it could just be that he's creating um, you know, the, the footprint for where she went missing and looking at the past of, uh, you know, previous unsolved murders and disappearances in that area, specifically young women. But that being said, uh, you could probably do that with any place in America. Definitely. He really does kind of give a uh, little jab here to John Scarinza and Troop F saying that the FBI has offered its assistance during the opening week of the case, but have only been utilized in a very minor way, interviewing family members and high school friends, then goes on to say that the, it's the, they're the finest resource in the world is available. And you, sir, which I believe is directed at the governor, should direct Lieutenant John Scarinza and Troop F to accept its offer. Yeah. Kind of, you know, a jab saying you guys can't do this on your own. You guys weren't capable of doing it within the first two or three days of this. And you need to bring in people who have more experience doing that. That's how I read that. Well, he's right. Yeah, totally right. As far as we know, he's, you know, as far as what we've read, he's, he's absolutely accurate with that. However, we don't know what John Scarinza and Troop F did internally you know what i mean there could be something that they've they were working on very intensely and maybe are still working on very intensely you know it could have got passed down but uh, you know according to this letter yeah it looks like they dropped the ball and had too much pride or perhaps laziness to accept the offer uh, of, of help from the fbi i had previously heard the fbi had not been involved so, yeah, it, it is curious that um, that the New Hampshire State Police would have had help available from the FBI to them and for them to have not used it. Maybe I've just watched too many TV shows and movies, but how does the state police tell the FBI what to do? I thought it was the other way around. I thought when the FBI came in, they take over the investigation. To my knowledge, that's how it works, too, that they have jurisdiction if they so choose. So maybe they backed off. And, you know, maybe it wasn't worth their man hours. But the most curious thing I think about this letter in totality to me is that if we believe Fred helped Mora get away, why would he be urging law enforcement and the governor, for God's sakes, to look further into this? It, you know, it is, a, it is a popular theory that Fred gave that $4,000 to Mora to help her start a new life. That is one of the popular theories out there. And if that's true, why would he want her found? Maybe at this point he realizes that where she's at is a place that is safe enough where he knows he can write this letter, look like he is still intensely searching for her. This letter is basically focused on the area she went missing. And it's not focused on where she could possibly be. And this letter was posted on moramurraymissing.com, which is a website run by the Murray family. So it's not like this was just a private letter that he sent he or uh, Helena Dwyer Murray, who apparently supposedly runs that site, thought it would be good to post publicly. Not sure why it needs to be public. And it's not posted in a way where it's like an official document that was uh, photocopied and scanned. It kind of looks like it was uh, copied and pasted from an email or something. That is what happened. And you can tell because some, some lines only take a word or two. And that's what happens occasionally. Yeah, it's completely copied and pasted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, and the, and the other thing is, you know, he accuses the police force of not 
you know, of taking possibly a fatal lack of action the night of the disappearance, but we read on one of our previous episodes that it didn't seem like that at all to us. It seemed like the police did a pretty good job. The first officer on the scene was there for two hours talking to neighbors, potentially going house to house. Right, that's what Clint said. Like, what else would he be doing there? I honestly can't imagine what the police would be doing during that time. Do you, I, do you really think that they were just thinking, well, she'll show up somewhere. You know, let's, let's pack it in. The sighting that he references at about 8 p.m. on February 9th was in an easterly direction four or five miles away from the crash scene. So Mora, being a runner, could have run four or five miles at 8 p.m.? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's Holland, though, right? I mean, let's say she leaves at, you know, she, she takes off at 7.30. Yeah, so she has a half hour to run four or five miles. It's about 10 miles an hour, which is definitely fast. It's definitely fast, but I guess she could do it. She could that's... do it, but Clint told us that she hadn't run competitively for over a year at this point. So maybe she's in not quite as good a shape. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much she worked out in the meantime, but... Four or five miles, like that's, I mean, that would basically be her strapping everything in, putting the backpack on. If she had a backpack, I'm not going to speculate about that, but, and then running, like not, not, not jogging this, you know, she's, she's hitting, you know, eight minute miles. That's a pretty, pretty fast clip in that temperature. It is. And, uh, and we also know the Kahlua bottle from the car was missing, so I know we had speculated on a previous episode that she probably took it with her if she left on her own volition. So then she's carrying that with her. Maybe she tossed it. Maybe. It'd be pretty weird to see a uh, a woman, you know, sprinting down the, the street at 8 p.m. on a on a f- cold February night of, of 12 degrees with a bottle of Kahlua in her hands. If she has a backpack, that's one thing, but that's still a little heavy to carry, you know, so if she gets into the accident and she is spotted four or five miles away, about a half an hour later, she's running at, at a pretty quick pace. At some point, she's going to toss that bottle of Kahlua. She's going to toss that bottle of alcohol. Or she runs with the alcohol. One or the other. And there's only a few minutes there where she can make a decision because she's going to like strap everything in and run away like literally she's running away if this was the person if she was the person that was seen four or five miles away it just doesn't like in my head if i'm in that situation i'm probably the car is there the the wine is in the car spilled everywhere i'm probably going to just leave the alcohol if i if i decide i'm gonna run i would never think to weight myself down if i think I'm going to I'm going to run now. Like I'm I'm getting out of here. Yeah, the the alcohol that's left in the car doesn't really coincide with the theory that some the you know another popular theory some people have is that uh, she was driving in tandem and she hopped in a friend's car. Well, why wouldn't she have brought the alcohol then? You know, I could see her have grabbed a bottle, but you know, she would have grabbed the rest of it if that was the case too. Maybe she grabbed what she could really quickly after the accident and starts running and was picked up down the road. She knows she only has a a pretty narrow window there. People have already seen her get into the accident. So it's time, you know, it's time to get out of there. And I'm just, you know, saying the theory of somebody picking her up because they traveled in tandem, she could know that they're probably just up the road and they probably stopped. So I'm just going to grab what I can real quick and I'm taking off. What's really interesting about that area, and we've been there, is that it is dark, but after the accident and people's eyes are out there and they've called the police, like, no one saw her run away. It's almost like she ran into the, like, I've always pictured her running into the woods and hiding out and, like, and, like, slinking through the woods until she comes out on the road if she were to be picked up by somebody. Because if she's just running away from the scene, someone... Someone like Butch Atwood, his wife, Faith Westman, her husband, her husband, they all have accounts 
of something right before the accident and and something after the accident and it seems like when all of them turned their backs she just like disappeared yeah she vanished and we get into odds again like what are the odds of that that's incredible yeah on a future episode i would actually like to talk about uh potentially some some uh, paranormal theories which i know have been floated out there a little bit on our message boards on the youtube page or uh, in our email so that is maybe something that we're going to tackle and i know maybe some of you are rolling your eyes at it but maybe that episode just isn't for you as far as believers of extraterrestrials i you know that that is sort of a hotbed area oh and you're talking with the uh, couple there um yeah betty and barney hill right yeah, one of the more famous abduction cases of all time. Right. What was that, the 50s? That was in September of 1961. I get nearly physically sick when I wake up each morning, and the thought of how really little effort it would have taken to rescue my daughter automatically flashes through my mind. This letter sounds like a guy who believes that Mora was picked up by some dirtbag. At this point, a year later, yeah, it, it certainly does. Over three months since her disappearance, and the only leads developed have been handled by, oh. So maybe what he's saying with the, the three months is that he's kind of going to a past tense sense of writing here. So at this point, it's been over three months since her disappearance, and the only leads developed have been handed to the state police by others. And then the next sentence is, yet still these guys maintain that they don't need any help. Well, that's a pretty, it's a pretty damning line. So what he's saying here is the only leads after three months of the disappearance have been handed to the state police by others. And the state police still maintain that they don't need any help, which is interesting that he feels that others have produced more leads than the state police, but he still will not communicate or take part in any sort of investigation that is being done by people like James Renner, people like Clint. He will not talk to these people. That's a great point. So the FBI has been shut out. They've offered assistance. They've been shut out. The state police can't get their shit together in order to to find his girl. And there's a whole community of people who would like to find his his daughter for him. And and he has absolutely shut them out. And that I can't figure that out. If we knew the truth, <laughs> it probably wouldn't be suspicious. It would probably make a lot of sense. You know, it would probably click together in a way where you just look at it and you say, that makes absolute sense. We've completely analyzed details that we didn't need to analyze because as some of the listeners has, have told us, you know, you look at any one of our lives and if we went missing tomorrow, you'd look at something that I did today and say, that was really suspicious of him. That was really odd, and that might lead to that. That's probably something that led to him disappearing. But the fact is, I'm probably not going to go missing tomorrow, so it doesn't look suspicious or odd. So, yeah, if 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 something came out and the answer was there, and they said this is exactly what happened, and the proof was behind it, we'd probably look at it and say, wow, you know, we probably over we probably overanalyzed some of this stuff. Well, I'm sure we're overanalyzing a lot of this stuff. Which comes back to my point again about Fred Murray not wanting people in this community to actively take part of, of, of finding his daughter. I mean, these people are taking their own time to overanalyze stuff. Well, could it be that, that Fred just doesn't want to talk to James Renner because he feels James Renner has lack of a better term talked crap about him in James's posts. Yeah. I have no idea how to answer that. There really are things about Fred that James has uncovered that are are very are very odd and very doesn't doesn't put Fred in a good light, and the right. fact that James will find these things and then approach Fred and be told that he, he wants no part of this book, he wants no part of James, and he wants he he, he wants no part of of this whole community. 
it just it there's nothing else you can do but say well this is this is not how somebody who wants his daughter to be found acts but then he did the boston magazine article written by bill jensen and you know he he posed for photos for it and that that article is called will the internet find missing umass student maura murray i think it would take incredible convincing to have fred murray talk to us yeah and i and i don't i don't know why because a lot of what is out there right now has has only happened because of his silence and things that he could say could completely discredit some of the trolls out there and the people who approach this with irresponsible behavior. Hopefully that makes sense. He could say something that will always be on record. You could hear his voice, you could, you could hear the sincerity in his voice and it'll always be on record. And no matter what is said about him or the case or his intentions, can never be disputed after that. And he did that episode of Disappeared a while ago as well and, you know, came off uh, like a broken man. It seems to me like he's accepted that she's gone, murdered, and he'll never see her again. But what if she's not? It's still his daughter. Like, what is he doing during his days when he thinks about her? Has he is 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 she dismissed from his mind already? I can't imagine that. I can't imagine it either. And they haven't officially declared her dead. But in his statements, he'll say that he'll go to his grave never knowing what happened to his little girl. There's a whole community who wants to help him find his daughter. We're only asking these questions. We're not saying he's guilty of anything. No, Look, we're just trying to talk it through. He could be known as a great father if he gave her that $4,000, she called him and said, Dad, I'm in some trouble. I need some money. I need to get away right now. He comes up the very next day, gives her $4,000, and he helps her get out of trouble. That's That could be a very protective dad, and then lying about it afterwards would only muddy the situation if he didn't want her to be found which is what it seemed like at one point. And then now, after reading these letters, it seems like he wants her to be found. It's very contradictory to me. And I, I would love to ask Fred about it. I mean, we, we're we only saying it's contradictory. We're, <laughs> we're not saying he's a bad guy. We're just saying he's somewhere in the middle of potentially a great father and um, a confused, broken man. Okay, the second letter is to Governor John Lynch. Starts, Governor Lynch, today, February 9th, 2005, marks the one-year point of my daughter Moore Murray's unlikely and highly suspicious disappearance following a minor car accident on Route 112 in North Haverhill, New Hampshire. The investigative body, New Hampshire State Police Troop F of Grafton County, has followed up its astonishingly careless go-through-the-motions response with an unnatural, steadfast refusal to communicate on the matter since. Their investigation includes not questioning neighbors who live 100 yards from and in sight of the accident scene until 10 days had passed. And this only after my family and friends had spoken to these people and expressed our shock about it to the police. My daughter could have walked right by or could have been picked up in a vehicle by the wrong person, in parentheses, persons, in full view of these houses. Not even the fact that their tracking dog lost Morris scent squarely before these properties one of which was owned by the last person who talked to Mora and another by the last person to actually see her, was enough to provoke the most elementary of basic investigatory technique. Phone records reveal that Mora called a couple who rent their condominium in Bartland, New Hampshire, where our family has vacationed for decades, just before she left the University of Massachusetts and headed directly that way last February 9th. When I recently discovered that these folks had never even been contacted by Troop F, it felt as if I had just been struck across the face with a 2 by 4 I remain convinced 
also that police have not fully developed a lead given to them concerning a local man who claimed he knew what happened to, quote unquote, that girl and disclosed the location where she had been held and by whom. Law enforcement's decision on this case from its inception has been to insist that you can take your pick of three possible happenstances, suicide, runaway, or hypothermia victim, but not consider the fourth, which is the probability, rather the possibility, that is that a bad guy grabbed her and they can't catch him. To support the diversion, the commander of Troop F twice stated during the Chronicle program on Channel 5 in Boston that Mora wrote a final letter to her boyfriend and left it in a prominent place in her dormitory room. This clearly suggests the, the traditional suicide letter, but the deception is that she never wrote or left such a letter at all, and the police were fully cognizant of this fact at the time. The pattern certainly doesn't indicate adherence to accepted and recommended police procedure. To date, the high law enforcement officials in Concord have reacted like ostriches to this pseudo-investigation by your Troop F. I'm left with a hollow, gut-wrenching sensation resulting from finally knowing for sure that the people responsible for finding my daughter are not even submitting a mail it, it, not, e not even submitting a mail in effort on her behalf. Worse still is that they remain determined to not accept the offer of meaningful participation extended by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is strangely odd indeed. I am appealing to you, sir, to ask Attorney General Kelly Ayotte to authorize the release of the records in this case to me through my petition under the Freedom of Information Act and the New Hampshire Right to Know Law I am basing this plea on the present classification of my daughter's case as a missing person situation and not as a criminal investigation. What could be the nature of this which must be so zealously veiled from the view and the motivation prompting such secrecy? With no informational resources available, I am left to desperately search for Mora all by myself. How can I do this if the police sit idly on the applicable evidence? Take, for example, her computer. If I could get it back, I might be able to discern who she contacted on that last afternoon and perhaps discover a new direction to follow. It's one thing if Troop F isn't willing to be part of the solution, but please don't allow them to continue to be part of the problem. Governor Lynch, you represent my final hope to help my little girl. I pray that you will regard reacting favorably to my entreaty not so much as your legal obligation, but as a parent, your moral responsibility. Hopefully, sign Frederick J. Murray. It's another weird letter, and it was written at the same exact time, basically? That's what it looks like. I mean, he says in the beginning of this letter, today, February 9th, 2005, marks the one-year point of my daughter. So they were dated at the same time. He does sound much more angry in the second one. Yeah, there's a lot of angry flow in this, right? Yeah, definitely more angry. This is definitely calling out the ineptness of, or it's calling out what he believes to be the ineptness of Troop F. This whole letter is about this. It's sad. This letter makes me sad. The first one made me curious, and this one makes me sad. He feels like a very helpless man here. Um, except, you know, again, the point that you made a few minutes ago is that he's not alone in this search, even though he says he is. He says it several times that he's alone in this case. He's alone in finding his daughter. You know, it's left all to him. Yeah, and, and yes, it was 2005, so there was no podcast, there was no blog of James Renner's at that point. So this could just be a, a helpless man. I mean, if, if my hands were tied on something like this, a family member of mine gone missing, I would be absolutely furious and probably doing the same thing he is. Here's an interesting line. Worse still is that they remain determined not to accept the offer of meaningful participation extended by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is strangely odd indeed. I just never thought that you could say no to the FBI. If the FBI has assigned people to this case, I just didn't think that you could refuse it. I would love to know about that a little bit more. Yeah, me too. 
it's interesting timing uh, that we're reading this when James Conrad uh, has all the, the, the posts when I remain convinced also that the police have not fully developed a lead given to them concerning a local man who claimed he knew what happened to that girl. Pretty sure that's what 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 he's uh, talking about. James Conrad is a former police officer with the New Hampshire State Police. And this is someone that James Renner wrote a recent blog post about. So you can check that out, moramurray.blogspot.com. And uh, it's pretty interesting. The headline is, Former New Hampshire State Trooper with Troubled Past Says Mora Was Murdered and Buried Under Suspect's House. It's extremely interesting. And you can see his actual Facebook comments on the Maura Murray Facebook group run by a member of Maura's family. All of what he's saying right there kind of flies in the face of everything that has been um, theorized. I don't know, but I would love to talk to this guy. Troubled past aside, um, and, it, and it is an interesting past that you can, you can Google that and, and take a look at it or just check out James's blog. But if you look into it, it would sort of give him some motive to defame the New Hampshire State Police. Regardless, if he believes he knows something, we would love to talk to him. If you are James A. Conrad or know James A. Conrad, please message us at missingmoramurray at gmail.com. We would love to speak with you about this. You put your comments out there. Your picture is on your profile. If you want your voice heard, this is a platform to do it. If someone has hijacked this person's identity and is uh, making these ridiculous claims then you really need to stop because this is what is making this whole case just be convoluted and, and, and confusing and there's no progress that's being made by, by claiming things like this. But if this is legit, love to talk to you. You've already put your words out there, you put your face out there, and you put your name out there. No reason to, to not put your voice out there. And speaking of people who are writing comments for their own enjoyment, uh, we, we have been getting trolled on YouTube a little bit by someone with the name Truth Seeker. On Wednesday the 26th, we woke up to uh, some messages that this person had written on the YouTube uh, video that, that we posted, where uh, the James Renner interview video. This person accused us of taking down some of his comments. And to which we responded, the producers of this podcast have never taken a single comment down. And anyone who says otherwise is lying. So I just find it funny that someone named Truth Seeker is lying. It would make absolutely no sense for us to take comments down. It would be completely counterproductive to what we're trying to do. We read everything that comes through and we consider everything that comes through. If you're not threatening in a, in a, in a way where, where we don't feel safe, your comments are going to stay up there. What I've said before is one of the major aspects of what we're trying to do is to filter out all of those trolls. So when you make a comment like that, you are really just giving yourself enough rope to hang yourself with. You are showing what you're capable of doing, which is confusing the whole situation. If you want to keep doing that, that's fine, but people need to know that you need to ignore this. If you have real information, say it. Don't yeah. just keep insulting the people who really want to find the truth here. Yes, and especially to call yourself truth seeker when we've had two actual truth seekers on in a row, James Renner and Clint Harding, who have act done some actual investigation on this. If you are some truth seeker, like you say, and have done some investigation of your own on this and know something that we should know, then contact us and stop trolling us. Right, and if you know what happened to Mora, then I will give my absolute guarantee if you provide proof that you know what happened to her this will stop this will all stop well truth seeker knows the truth he told us it's done go to the cops go to the state police go to the fbi all you're doing right now is sitting in front of your computer and getting off on how disrespectful you can be 
And if I'm not mistaken, this is a person that we have already chatted with and invited to be a part of the documentary, invited to be interviewed because we thought this person may have had some knowledge and would be an interesting person to interview for the documentary. But uh, and you know, and that still stands. We would we would do an interview if you actually have something to say. My biggest fear is that we just think that this person's a troll and we start, you know, writing them off. This is why we are not going to delete any comments. What if something in there is the truth, you know, is actually the truth and we delete it, you know? It makes no sense for us to delete comments if you're if you're not being malicious and threatening. It makes no sense for us to delete the comments, but people who read them have to take it with a grain of salt because this person is is being intentionally malicious. And a lot of the anger he was writing about was directed towards James Renner and saying that he is defaming the family and saying that he wouldn't know what a sociopath is. And that, that led to some pretty interesting debate on the comments section of our YouTube video with the interview with James Renner, but also James Renner's blog at moramari.blogspot.com in his post about episode six, the episode he was on, about 100 comments. And a lot of it had to do with his comment about calling Mora a sociopath, which we don't know. Lance and I don't know if she was, but simply being a sociopath means having no empathy. And I think people immediately jump to, oh, he's calling her a murderer, or he's calling her a crazy person or a killer. The psychopath and sociopath are actually very similar. They, they can Those words can be used interchangeably, but they mean lacking empathy and the saying goes all killers are psychopaths but not all psychopaths are killers and in fact you'll find i think it's i think the percentage is two percent of the american public are considered psychopaths lack but that the only thing that means is they lack empathy a lot of people you know are psychopaths would be clinically diagnosed as that People you might be sharing your house with right now. Chances are if you know 100 people, you're close to 100 people, friends, family members, chances are at least a couple of them lack an empathetic quality that would get them a sociopathic or psychopathic diagnosis. And that's all James was trying to say. And a lot of people said, well, he's not a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and he shouldn't be saying that kind of thing. Well, that's his opinion. And he said it. He said, I believe Mara Murray was a sociopath. So Exactly. I mean, I don't, I don't know why everyone was so up in arms about it. But I will say, for the purposes of this podcast, I think, and it was suggested to us on comments and through email, that we get a psychologist or um, a criminologist someone on a professional on to profile Mora and potentially Fred too. To profile Fred as well. Yeah. I think that would be fascinating and we would absolutely love to talk to someone like that. So if you are listening and are a professional in this business and know this story, we would absolutely love to, to talk to you. Please contact us at missingmoramurray at gmail.com. And if you know someone who you think would be interested in appearing on this show and profiling Maura Murray and or her father, please contact us with their information after you ask them. And this is what we're, uh, what we're left with because we don't have the direct players in this case who want to talk about this. Um, as much as they're upset with uh, the way law enforcement has handled this case, they don't want to talk with the people who are actually trying to do this. Like we're we're calling on people to to uh, give us their their psychological breakdown of Maura Murray. We're actually trying to do something kind of you know kind of on our own to to forward any sort of uh, like progress in in this case, and that's what we're left with because we don't have the people who are direct players. They don't talk about this anymore, and we're we're only a, a maybe maybe seven to ten years away from this becoming folklore. You know how quick things become folklore. Like things became folklore so quick back in like you know probably stopped around like honestly probably stopped around two thousand four two thousand five, but. I mean, I remember things that happened in my town when I was growing up that were mysterious. And, you know, 10 years later, it feels like folklore. 
this is this has got a little bit more lasting power and we're trying to give it a, a more legs and get the dialogue going in a mature respectful way using the tools that we have at our disposal in the time that we live in the podcasting the internet the blogging so we're if we didn't have these things this case would just fall into folklore and everything would be forgotten about and all of the misinformation would be made into something bigger or something else and you know before you know it 15 years go by and and people are talking about don't drive on the new hampshire roads at night don't do that remember that girl who went missing it becomes folklore Lance and I had talked about doing a live version of Missing Mara Mari, and we wanted to do it online and give everyone the opportunity to chime in and to talk to us, and we wanted to have James Renner on for that episode, so we're going to try to see if we can schedule that, so if you have anything you want to say directly to me, Lance, or James Renner, you will have the opportunity in a live show that we're going to do online in the coming weeks. We've been getting so many good responses and thoughtful feedback from you guys that we decided that a live show would definitely help out the interactive platform that we want to keep going. So just keep following us. We'll put the information out there and uh, make it real easy for how we're going to do this uh, this live call-in.